Hi again, everybody. Thanks for joining Art and me as we talk to Dr. Liz Lister again about all things medical for us folks in our act two. Hmm. So I have, right. I, have, I have a question because we do a lot of things. Um, uh, we talk a lot of uh, issues that deal more with women than men. Maybe women have been paying closer attention to their medical conditions as they get older. Uh, we hear about, you know, uh, osteoporosis and things like that. A lot of those things seem to be geared towards women. But uh, one of the things that uh, almost universally men over the age of 60, certainly over the age of 70, will experience would be an enlarged prostate. Well, that's what we, you have trouble urinating. Uh, and sometimes it can be cancerous, sometimes it can't be. Uh, so that's the way we begin to think about it when we have problems urinating. Can you sort of give us a, a sense of the background of what that's all about? Absolutely, yes. As you said, it's extremely common. It's uh, thought that by about age 55, one out of four men will experience symptoms of benign prostate enlargement. Uh, and then when they get up over, let, let's say, 75 years old, it can be as many as half of men will experience uh, symptoms of this type of, uh, it's considered a benign tumor, the most common benign tumor that occurs in men. Hmm. So it happens to everybody, as far as I know, and at every male, and it happens at different ages and different severities. And they're always looking for, I guess what, not just that it's enlarged, but they're looking Correct. to see if it's a bad reason it's enlarged. Well, yes, so we're talking about benign enlargement of the prostate and for better or worse, it's cancer doesn't necessarily grow to a size that causes those particular symptoms. All right. So when we talk about benign prostate enlargement, uh, we're talking about obstructed urine flow. We're talking about difficulty starting the urinary stream or being able to continue it so that it's intermittent urine flow. All of those are most often going to be benign enlargement of the prostate. Okay, and there's a genetic, there is a genetic component. And so you made me think of this because the younger a man is who's experiencing this, the more likely that there's a genetic influence. Ah. Right? So if he's under age 65, for example, and he's having significant symptoms, that could be uh, a genetic influence as well. Yeah. Okay, so benign, benign is basically uh, indicating that it's not cancerous. So it's not uh, Correct. that, not it's cancerous. not that, it's not that thing. Uh, it's not, uh, although I know that there are positive and negative false things with a PSA test, but assuming that your PSA tests uh, have never shown that you have cancer or likely have cancer. I, I think the most important thing maybe the takeaway from here is that if you're just growing older and you're having some symptoms with this, what are the kind of things that you can do to reduce the severity of, of uh, benign uh, uh, situation. Yeah, there's three, I would say there's three levels of treatment. This is very common for lots of different medical conditions, and but it happens to be the case uh, for benign prostate enlargement. So for the first level of treatment, uh, the first place to start can be with medical treatment. There are medicines that can help shrink the prostate or can relax the muscles around the urethra that are normally there to control the urine flow, but in the case of benign prostate enlargement can be contributing to the difficulty with urination. So there are drugs that can help with that. Okay. Then the opposite extreme to that is surgery to reduce the size of the prostate. Uh, I was in medical school over 30 years ago, and it was much more common then than it is now because we have an intermediate level of treatment, which is what we call minimally invasive procedures. Uh, so I've had many patients who've undergone these types of less invasive procedures. Uh, they include uh, the different ways to shrink the tissue, uh, either with radio frequency or the latest one that I'm aware of uh, is basically a way to 
it shrinks the prostate tissue by destroying some of it, all right, with, with a steam, with heat. Okay, so that's what the radio frequency does. Uh, but so there have been there's ongoing efforts to try to do minimally invasive procedures that can help men uh, alleviate the symptoms. So you always want to try the medical approach first, uh, then maybe minimally invasive. And I have not been aware of either with um, men that I know or in my practice who have had the, the transurethral resection of the prostate, or they call it a TURP. That's the abbreviation, T-U-R-P. That was a very common procedure when I was in medical school. Now it's significantly less common and being replaced with less invasive pre procedures, which have outcomes uh, from a side effect standpoint. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Supplements seem to be popular. At least the companies are making a lot of money off of them. Uh, anything that's anti-inflammatory, I would think, would help. I would imagine that that would help uh, also for some men if they're if they have their testosterone level measured. Testosterone does some converting into dihydrotestosterone, and it is considered that the or DHT as we call it. So it's considered that an elevated mm -hmm. DHT might be associated with benign enlargement of the prostate. Uh, and there are besides medications, there are supplements. So you may have probably heard of saw palmetto. A mm -hmm. lot of men's supplements have that ingredient. It inhibits the enzyme that converts the testosterone into the DHT, and that's how it helps with that. Ah, ah, interesting. Well, it's so common. It, it's uh, good to discuss it. Well, thank, thank you yep. for um, the talking about the benign. I think the important thing is that whoever you're... Uh, uh, see for your medical care. Uh, it's something, uh, especially uh, men, should be talking about uh, on a regular basis. Once you're over fifty, once a year, just talk about it, and and hopefully right. you'll have a test and it'll ease your mind. And when you do have some problems with it, they'll be able to give you some advice to make it more manageable at at a minimum. That's right. It's very important. If, as you said, talk about it with your doctor if you're having the symptoms. The, the digital rectal exam is a way to check the size of the prostate. Also, they can do a, a ultrasound of the bladder, they have you go urinate, and then they ultrasound the bladder and see how much urine is left behind. Hmm. That's another way to make sure because chronic lack of draining of urine can back up into the kidneys and cause more important problems. So yeah. definitely get it checked out. Dr. Liz, thank you so much. Thank you. You are welcome. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.